All right, good morning, everyone. Um, I didn't get quite a lot of what you said, but at least I heard my name, so. Um, and um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try to um, squeeze everything that I have to say in 20 minutes, and then you're gonna have like um, around about 10 minutes for your questions, so um, please help me out with it. Um, that was already a bit of like presentation, so I'm not gonna um, go too much into um, what, what I do, um, since it was said already. Um, I was asked to kind of like bring a study case, and since I'm the first um, speaker here, which I'm not really sure if it's either um, a privilege or a curse, um, I will just go a little bit more with like reflection on like what happened in, uh, let's say, my career, so to say, like in less last um, five years. Um, we can maybe try first if this works. It did before. Okay. Um, so, like, I'm going to talk about like celebrating failure. So, like, in design thinking, as you know, like, failure is a big word. Um, but of course, it's not the same thing as um, if you fail within the process or if you personally fail in um, bringing design thinking to a corporate environment. And I'm definitely going to talk a lot about um, how to bring design thinking in the corporate environment and um, how to um, also make it sure um, it works. Uh, my background is in communication design, um, although I'm definitely sure that like designers are the worst design thinkers. Um, however, like it somehow helped me to to understand like the basic principles. Um, worked as an art teacher um, in the secondary school of economics in Ljubljana. Um, saw like chairs flying around, um, kids being like really unmotivated, and like my main question was like, how can I motivate? students um, in a way that they would basically motivate themselves. So this so-called um, inner motivation. And um, this is the point where I kind of realized um, what design thinking is. Um, I went to Potsdam to the Hasselblad Institute um, to, to see how it works and I immediately knew that like this is something I could definitely benefit from a lot and of course um, my students as well. So it's about like Teamwork, as you know, so it's about um, getting really deep in the in the in the whole challenge, like being creative while you search for solutions and like whatnot. Um, however, I never really got back, um, so I started like studying on Hasselblad. I also studied in Japan um, in the University of Tokyo, and I co-founded a company, Kill Your Darling, in Berlin, um, that was successfully killed last year. Um, so right now, as it was already said, I'm a coach at the Hasselblad um, Institute of Design Thinking. Um, I'm a head of user lab and uh, design thinking at FISMAN. That's basically what my talk is going to be. And I also work with students, finally again, on the Anhalt University of Applied Sciences in Dessau, which is basically the Bauhaus um, uh, campus, the, at least the former one. Um, but anyways, so like when I was a child, I was I was afraid of ghosts. So um, I was really afraid that like you know I'm just gonna go to bed one night and like in the corner of the room there's gonna be um, some kind of like a creature coming up. Um, this you know like vision of um, this like white light like trying to kind of like talk to you and so on. And like my mom um, kind of realized the fear I had and um, she said, you know what, when I was a child, I was told that fear is hollow on the inside and absent on the outside. And I was like, okay, but like if there's like nothing outside and nothing inside, there still has to be something over there, right? So what is it then? Like what is this contour or like what is this rim or outline or whatever. So this is exactly what my fear was. This is the ghost. So you know like it's it's just kind of like floating around but like you can still see it. And although I was um, let's say a little bit more relaxed from then because I realized that like it's not flesh and bone, it can it cannot do anything to me, I was still really afraid that I'm gonna at some point meet this outline of, of light. And this is exactly what the fear of failure is. So the fear of failure as such is stronger than fighting with consequences of failure when it once happens. And that's why in all huge corporations, people are so afraid of fear. They know that like nowadays almost every 
corporation, every working environment is um, celebrating fear. It's like trying to, in a way, um, make it really accessible to people. It's trying to even present it as a part of the company culture. But knowing that like nothing is going to really happen to you still doesn't take away the fear that it might actually happen one day. Um, so I'm going to now tell you how was it when I came to Fisman. Um, but like first of all, I would like to tell you what Fisman is. This definitely looks a bit like a sales pitch, although that's, uh, that's not my intention. However, we are hiring. Um, <laughs> and um, just like I would like to give you some like, numbers that you see the, the scale. So Fisman Group is a 100% owned um, family company um, located in Allendorf in Germany, which is between nothing and nothing. So like we're again, you know, um, talking about this like hollow fear. Um, but like for some who are good in geography between Kassel and Frankfurt, um, we have three divisions. So um, the first one would be the classical boiler. So like when you, for instance, decide to build a house and um, uh, decide for a, for a heating system, you will hopefully most probably like choose ours. Um, the second division is industrial uh, boilers, so like we're talking about huge machines that are, are uh, located in schools and like tourist ships, whatnot, um, like up to 60 tons um, heavy. And the third division is a cooling one, so like when you go to uh, one of uh, German supermarkets and take a daily product um, out of the cooling cabinet, it's most probably going to be ours. Um, we have like 2.5. Three, sorry. Yeah, it's a little bit um, not working. Or I, I can also just give you a sign and um, you can press. But yeah, so but still one back. Yeah. Um, although I, I should know this by heart, so I can I can, I can actually do it without it. So like we have a two point um, four billion revenue. If we go one back. Yes, um, around twelve thousand employees. We have sales activities in 74 countries, so it's definitely an international company, and uh, 23 production sites in 12 countries. And our claim is Fisman creates living spaces for generations to come. So like my work is basically to, to see like where the trends are, especially like in the field of um, um, smart home and uh, mobility, like connectivity and like whatnot. And um, I was like personally hired by the CEO of, 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 of Fisman. Mm, and uh, we were just like talking about like how we can do it, like what, what can design thinking do in the company with like a rather rigid structure. And he was kind of like, you know, just do it. And this is the moment. Try it. No. Yeah, okay. just make it. By the end of the presentation, we're gonna, yeah, we're, we're gonna make it. Um, he was like, yeah, just, just, just make it. And I was like, okay, what could go wrong, you know, when you have like all the freedom, when you can like really work with whatever you want, even the money wasn't the problem. Um, so like, what could, what could potentially, you know, like be, be a failure? Well, everything, just because like you have no metrics, like you have no structure, you have like no shoes to, to step in. And um, what did I actually face when I came to the organization? A really strong, a uh, really strong um, top-down hierarchy. That's like one of things, you know, like you have, you have like all kinds of people you have to report to and like nobody really dares to say yes before like the superior says yes and like the, the superior has to wait until the, the next superior says yes and like when you get a decision it's most probably going to be too late already. Um, and like we have a really modest feedback awareness as well. So, you know, like it, if it's either good then you're going to say it, if it's bad you won't. Um, of course, these things kind of like change in, in two years since I've been um, there, not only because of me, but like generally. But this was like the, the moment when I started. Silo mentality, like everybody does more or less the same stuff. And then you realize after, I don't know, like um, several months that like your colleague is just like sitting um, five tables away from you is actually working on the same thing as you are. Um, and um, we do have strong doubts on digitalization. So like why do we need these digital products? Like what are they? Are they going to take our jobs away? Um, and stuff like that. And uh, most important things, like non-existing failure culture. So like in our company, we say like 99% is not good enough. 
which I believe is great when you talk about products, but it's not that great when you talk about the company culture. And these things are, in a way, mixed up a little bit. This is our innovation center. So it's like super clean, and um, you can see these like nice plants over here. Um, it was just a day before Miss Merkel came to visit. Um, so everything was really fresh um, over here. Um, and uh, I'm just going to talk about like how we started with design thinking and like kind of like do it together with this um, uh, three main elements. So we're not talking about desirability, viability, feasibility, whatever. I'm, I'm sure you know these like three main circles. I'm going to talk about process, space, and people. Um, since I'm the first speaker, I kind of like, you know, dare to, to get a chance to kind of explain it in a very fast way, just to kind of like put everybody on the same page. Um, so like the, the process I kind of like brought to Fisman is based on um, Hasso Platna um, School of Design Thinking from, from Potsdam. American um, has five steps, like we use six, however, the same thing. Um, first, we um, try to understand the challenge, then we observe, as you know, then we create a point of view or a persona, um, we go and ideate, we prototype the solution, and then we test it. Like, nothing new. Um, realized, I realized like after a like, few, few months that it's just not going to work, that like, we definitely have to cut away at least a half of the process. So like, we cut away the understanding because I realized like, when you talk about really specific challenges, the understanding phase was basically just for me as a coach to kind of like update me what the whole thing is all about. And like in the field of biogas, I had to understand like how bacteria, our products by the way, work, which of course I still didn't, it was just like Chinese on the wall. Um, or like for instance, um, how a 60 um, towns heavy industrial boiler gets configured. Um, so we just cut it because people definitely knew what the challenge is all about because they gave it to me. Observation, how do you observe um, your end customers in the area where around 95% of people in the village where the headquarter is located actively work for the company. And then like you have 2% of people left who either used to work at the company, will work at the company, or like their closest relative works there. So they're super biased. So like you can't really get any credible insights. And uh, in general, the persona can spoil it all. So like it really led us to a wrong persona, like wrong assumption. What is wrong with personas? Like first of all, um, if you conduct only two or three interviews, it's just not gonna be enough. Um, although you have like really good insights. And um, if design thinking is really gonna work in your company, then it's gonna start asking the, or like questioning the, the main business models, because very often customers are not okay with products as they are. And um, the answer you're gonna get from the C-level, no matter even if you're right or not, they will say like, yes, so what? You tested it on like three people, and like you're claiming that like we should change our whole product portfolio because you talked to three people and like they gave you like interviews of like 45 minutes each. Well, hell, I mean, we did qualitative um, research as well, but even more importantly, we did a quantitative research as well. We called over like 500 people, our customers, and they gave us a 4.5 out of 5. So we're hell good. That's kind of like, okay, so we have to change it. So the persona as such doesn't work. And this is also the general trap of design thinking that like very often it leads us to rather um, shallow personas full of cliches and stereotypes. You know, like on the beginning you have this need that like you'd kind of like tackled, and then in the end you just like throw in all possible things like um, um, what, what, the person, what kind of the car does the person drive and like married or not, and like what's the political view and stuff like that. So it just doesn't work. Um, so we kind of changed it in this kind of area. It, it has six steps, but it's rather just a coincidence. We deliver personas with the help of the agency. This stuff is normally around one month to two months long, and it costs a lot of money. Um, and then we gave those personas, or we still do give them, to teams. And we say like, okay, now we have to define um, when is the time frame that like, you're gonna ideate for. Then we have to define like, where is it? And then it's time to start delivering. Um, with like finding a solution, 
making it easy to use, of course, and um, also ask ourselves, like, why are we doing it? So, like, the easiest um, combination out of it would be, let's design for someone who's a regular user who lives in the present um, and the future, let's say, won't dramatically change. And like the opposite of it, it's like let's um, design something for the extreme user um, who lives in the future where like conditions are going to be completely different, like due to cultural change, um, like political impact, um, and of course, um, nature itself. So avoiding failure, rule number one, like it's more a note to myself, not to you, is like make sure you defend the right insights and let experts do their thing. Second thing, I've, I've seen like numerous of innovation spaces. Like you come to this like huge headquarter, um, they're guiding you in this kind of like, you know, um, rather um, gray building hallways with this wall-to-wall um, -wall, um, carpet, as we call it. Um, and then you suddenly come to this like huge room and like, you know, everything is like in lead lights and you have like, um, um, uh, whiteboards and like maybe a 3D printer somewhere, you know, it's like this is our innovation space, you know, like here ideas um, um, come to, 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 to life um, and uh, well actually, I mean nice, but like what people are doing is that they are creating an innovation theater. So, you know, like they're having this like crazy space with like lots of post-its. I mean, there's nothing wrong with post-its. I'm like, I'm definitely um, here the, against the Natasha Yen um, design thinking is bullshit talk that uh, later Sandra is going to talk about. Um, however, um, don't do it in a, let's say, really condensed way in like only one room of like 50 square meters. Um, because people are going to start calling you paradise birds. That was my nickname. I was a paradise bird. Um, and that's not what you want. Rather, take a really boring white room, change it like during the workshop, if the workshop is the, the, the thing you start with, and show participants what have you done in these two days. And they can see the whole process of like this white corporate room into something really colorful filled with idea. So where is the table soccer? We don't have it. Um, avoiding failure, so as I said, don't create an innovation circus. And then people, I have like two minutes and 40 for people. Um, so I would say like as a coach, as a facilitator, as a catalyst or whatever, how you want to call it, messiah, um, redefine your role and like decide like what you want to be um, in the company. And I was stupid enough uh, when I started like, to think that everybody has to do warm-ups, that everybody has to um, uh, play the ninja or like to do the um, mushroom warm-up and so on. I thought that like we always have to play with like Play-Dohs and Legos and um, all the stuff that like made everything look really, really goofy. Um, it was a nice, a nice thing, but then I realized that I don't necessarily need it. I don't need to be perceived as a paradise bird. Like, Having this um, knowledge about user centricity is enough that I want to convey. Don't try to take your sea level out of the comfort zone with playing a ninja. Rather, ask them something about end customers, and then you're going to get them out of the comfort zone. Um, so, from from customers to users. So, like first of all, I would say define metrics in advance. So, d define like what are your process outcomes. And like, what are your product outcomes? So how many people you want to train? How many people you want to be in contact with design thinking? Um, like, what, what, what number of like special events you want to host and stuff like that? With products, it can be a little bit trickier. But at least say, we might start developing like one product per year. It's definitely enough. Um, start inside out. So like, don't affect business models, but like rather try to gain creative confidence um, to people. And um, that's something that like your C-level might not necessarily like. I mean, super sorry for those who are C-level here. Um, and um, they've always said like, we need results, you know? It, it's not just pure um, empowerment of like people's skills. You've been doing it for a year already. Like now it's time to see something. Just be patient and like have really thick skin. 
be aware of limitations. So design thinking cannot do everything. I mean, it definitely doesn't do everything. So you will definitely have to work together with like business developers, with like people from like venture capital um, to kind of like get an idea a little bit more haptic. I personally see design thinking as an innovation or idea spark, if you want, but it doesn't have the knowledge of estimating like how much revenue we're going to generate. Even if it is, it's no, most probably going to be wrong. And that's the failure you don't want. It's a not, not cool part of the failure. Um, face middle management. So like whenever you have a workshop, you will see that like junior level is, of course, like very modest. Um, C level is chilled and like laid back. They, they, they reach in their life what they wanted. But the middle management has to show the juniors who is going to be their next boss and actually has to show to the C-level that like they are worth of this future position. So in a way, kind of like, you know, tackle them nicely because they're the ones who will kind of um, decide like if your role is anyhow valuable or not. Involve end users. So like try to get quotes and communicate it um, to the C-level because in our company, with like 12,000 people, it's like my department is the only one that brings quotes to the sea level. And like they realized that um, we are actually the link. And like if they really want to ask someone um, what they think or feel about our solutions, um, they have to ask us. And uh, that's how you make your position a little bit more fixed. So avoiding failure, keep what you need and change the rest, but then call it something else. Maybe it's not design thinking anymore. Who cares? As long as you are user-centered. Don't defend the methodology. Defend the user. Bam. I think I'm on time. Cool.